is going on, you wascally wabbits? <laughs> That's my Elmer Fudd. I don't know why did I, I? I don't know why I did that. That was weird. Okay, hi, hello. I just that just popped into my mind, like because I'm a weirdo. Um. Okay, we're on chapter seven of Mad Max novelization, where we last left off. Uh, Fief McAfee, a.k.a. The Chief, is meeting with the commissioner, who we know as Labatouche, and uh, they are discussing the the pros and cons of, of uh, tempting their best pursuit man with candy, motorized candy, in this case, the pursuit special. So we meet the pursuit special. And um, yeah, let's see. Let's see where things go to in chapter seven. Chapter seven. Jerusalem was a town which never made a map. Its only importance was that a secondary freeway, Highway 69, <laughs> and a rarely used railway happened to coincide there. In better times, the cross-country road rigs had stopped at Jerusalem to transfer their cargo onto freight trains, but that had long since stopped, and its only function now was to service trucks and travelers who used the highway. The railway still ran more or less once a week, but it was more through some bureaucratic oversight that through any, it was more through that bleh, the railway still ran more or less once a week, but that was more through some bureaucratic oversight than through any commercial necessity. The dying town consisted of a gas station, a pub, a diner, and the train station. I think we know who this is. We're about to meet. We're about to be introduced to the one, the only. Few people ever went there. Fewer people even remember it. Like countless days in the past and undoubtedly like countless days in the future, the only sign of life in the town was a dog flopped on the gravel shoulder of the road. It could have been dead except for one ear pricked up honing in on some noise as yet inaudible to human hearing. That was a great paragraph. Great description. I, you know, I was wrong about Terry Hayes. I'm sorry, Terry. You're good, good, good writing. I just didn't like that Mad Max, you know, internal monologue that was external for some reason. Gradually, the dog raised its head. With both ears alert now, it looked through the heat haze down the highway. It stayed in the position for several seconds and then rose to its feet, standing in the dust, looking in the direction of a low rumble, like a faraway thunder. Wide-eyed, lips curled back to its bare teeth, the dog tensed every muscle as the roar of massed, high-powered machines rolled along the highway towards it. Out of the shimmering heat, the first riders appeared. They were arranged across three lines in a wedge-shaped formation, kind of like duck formation, which seemed at first sight to stretch forever. The man at the head of the phalanx wore the same uniform as the 60 or 70 outlaws who followed him. He sat astride his superbike, a thousand cc's of black power in racing leathers, complete with clip-on knee and elbow pads and full-face helmet, all covered in dust, spattered in dust and spattered insects. His bike boasted full racing, his bike boasted full racing fairing, and it had obviously been built for speed over long, long distances. The only thing distinguishing him from his comrades was a feather armband, which he wore around his right bicep. He had a small tattoo on his cheek. The noise was overwhelming as the black leathered, high-powered horde roared into Jerusalem. The dog wrapped its tail between its legs and lo looped, lopped, loped, loped off to hide behind a shed attached to the crumbling railway station. The owner of the gas station ran onto the wooden veranda surrounding his office to gaze in, in awe at what he believed could only be the devil's henchman. He was joined on the other side of the road by the driver of a beat up interstate freight rig and two young girls, 15 going on 30, dressed in tight jeans, halter tops, and inviting smiles. Oh, this is great. The sound of massed exhausts built to a booming crescendo as the bikies thundered through the town. Bikies, that's a good name for a band too. We're the bikies. Seemingly performing some primitive 
drive past, then died as the leader reached the other end of the main street and turned back. In the movie, we see them doing the circle burn with the tire and the uh, line going straight through, which is representation of the the symbol that they have on their cheeks, the tattoo of the, the Arcolite gang, essentially, all led by the toe cutter. Uh, then died as the leader reached the other end of the main street and turned back. He passed his troops, still going in the opposite direction. A stage manager couldn't have done a better job. As he rode by the other bikies, they peeled off to the left to angle park their magnificent evil machines <laughs> in the dust on the shoulder of the road. By the time he reached the end of the column, all of the bikes were in position. He pulled off his road. He pulled off the road, leaving it at the head of the row, throbbing metal. Head, bleh, 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 bleh. He pulled his off the road, leaving it at the head of the row of throbbing metal. In unison, the riders switched off their engines and waited for the leader to dismount. The silence was more threatening than the thunder. Slowly, the leader lifted off his helmet, deliberately swung one leg across the fuel tank, and stood next to his bike. There was not a sound in the street. His hair, flattened by the long ride, was blonde, the eyes blue. His face had the unmistakable twist of cruelty. He was big. The shoulders beneath the leather were broad, and his thighs swelled against his leg leggings. Curling his lip, he looked down on his troops and then threw his helmet to the man on the next bike. What a great description of the toe cutter. Man, even if you didn't know what the toe cutter looked like, you have a, a crisp image of what the toe cutter could look like in your mind, even though it doesn't exactly visually uh, represent Hugh, who played, uh, who played the toe cutter. It was obviously a time-honored sig signal for without a word being spoken, the others dismounted. So they wait for him to dismount, and then they dismount. They pulled off their helmets and began yelling abuse at one another. As they mingled in twos and threes in the middle of the street, the leader walked across the dust bowl, which served as a driveway to the filling station, and stood facing the owner. Afternoon, mister, the owner said. The leader looked him up and down. Raising his eyes back to the man's face, he said, I'm known as the Toe Cutter, and I'm here to meet a friend who came in on this morning's train. Sorry, mister, nobody came in on this morning's train. No one's come in on that train in years, to my recollection. I said, in case you didn't hear, that I'm here to meet a friend who came in on this morning's train. Well, yeah, I'm really sorry, mister, but I think he must have missed it. The only thing that came in this morning were a few crates and, uh, see, in the movie, there's a beat, but it's not here. And uh, a coffin. His conversation, never mind. His conversation trailed off as he realized his mistake. That's my friend, mister. Yeah, well, sorry about that. I didn't understand. It's a matter of seeing the agent and signing the papers. And where is this agent? You're right here. That's uh, That's me. Now, why don't you be real helpful and just? Quickly, the man moved back into his office. Uh, sure, wait here. I'll, I'll be right back. As the frightened owner disappeared, seven of the toe cutter's trusted lieutenants drifted to his side. One of them, Johnny the boy, didn't sport the same tattoo on his right cheek. Together, Johnny, Bubba Zanetti, Mudguts, Kundalini, Clunk, Diabano and Starbuck flanked their leader. Yeah, baby, the motherfucking toe cutter gang. Oh man, I love those names. Mudguts. Mudguts does the dance with Kundalini. Kundalini's the one who gets his arm cut off. In my movie Romeo's Distress, I named someone uh, Mr. Kundalini after Kundalini, and I also used the name Zanetti, Pickle Zanetti, in my second film uh, Gouge Away. I just, I love it, man. I love it. But now. He doesn't have Johnny doesn't have the tattoo on his cheek because he hasn't killed anybody yet. I think that's what it is, because they say at the beginning of the book that you get the tattoo and you kill somebody. And Johnny, the boy's initiation is Jim Goose. Holy shit. See, this gets all lost in the movie, man. It's funny. I was reading on a Reddit and they were like, they were like, Terry Hayes takes great liberties that are not present in the Mad Max movies. Like, no, Terry Hayes brings nuance and detail where the movie fails to. And again, I don't blame George Miller for that 
you know, it's just, you know, it's there in the details, but you have to know what the details are. You have to read the script. Um, wow, that is interesting. Quickly, the owner returned. Well, we've got ourselves organized here, he said, as he came through the door wearing his railway agent's peaked hat and carrying the clipboard, supporting some dog-eared papers. If you just like to sign here, we can move over to the station and you can collect the, uh, uh, I mean, you could get your friend. He handed the clipboard and a pen to the toe cutter and pointed to the spot for his signature. The toe cutter didn't appear to take his eyes off the man. Then he grabbed the pen and he scratched a large X across the bottom of the page. His stare didn't flicker. See, I understand why you would cut that. It's not needed for pacing reasons. You probably don't need it. But for like character, oh my God. Because I'm sitting here, it's like, why does an outlaw like the toe cutter even need why does the toe cutter even need to sign his name if he's an outlaw, but putting an X is the perfect amount of, I'm going to play your game, but I'm not going to do what you tell me. It's like such a, that's such a move. It makes sense. So he scratched a large X across the bottom of the page. His stare didn't flicker. The man looked down at the mark and felt the toe cutter's eyes on him and cleared his throat. Uh, fine. Uh, I don't guess no one looks at them anyhow. It's just bureaucracy, man, which is kind of a theme a little bit. It's a minor theme in the Mad Max movies, a little bit, in the sense that, like, the, the, the cops are sort of, like, tied up by, you know, the bureaucratic restraints of, like, uh, Labatouche and his, and his commissioners at the Halls of Justice, uh, where, where, you know, you have Roger Ward as Feith going, as long as the paperwork's clean, boys, you can do what you want out there. Um <laughs> Uh, I find I guess no one looks at them anyhow. Don't guess they do. Don't guess they do, said the toe cutter. Well, let's go then, he said, moving off across the road. The gang following in behind. Oh, maybe that's the toe cutter saying that? Well, let's go then, he said, moving across the road. The gang falling in behind him. The night rider was waiting for them. Together, the large delegation walked onto the platform, kicking up dust of years, passing long shattered windows of the waiting room and the knee deep litter piled in the stations in the station master's office. Hey, I reckon that's what you're looking for over there, the agent said, indicating a surprisingly small coffin sitting on the trolley at the far end of the platform. It don't look like there was too much of him left, he remarked, and then as he felt the eyes of Bubba and Mudguts turn on him, added quickly, the poor bastard. The toe cutter turned on his heel and grabbed the man's face between his hands like this. <sniffs> Pinching his cheeks between thumb and forefinger, he looked straight into his eyes. The Night Rider, he hissed. His name is the Night Rider. The agent realized from the eyes in front of him that the, that the agent realized that from the eyes in front of him that the toe cutter was capable of anything. Like a child who could tear the wings off flies, the toe cutter would get a thrill of the excitement out of hurting him, seeing him slowly twist in pain. Uh, the the night rider he managed to enunciate through twisted lips. Deliberately, the toe cutter increased the pressure between his fingers and simultaneously pulled the flesh away from the man's cheekbones until the agent realized that his mouth was about to rip at the corners. Tears were stinging down his face. A flicker of pleasure crossed the toe cutter's face. The scene is so much better in the book. Remember him when you look up at the night sky. The agent could no longer speak. His face was a blanket of pain and his mind a bed of fear. Somehow he managed to nod his agreement. Good. I'm glad you understand the situation. The toe cutter whispered as he relaxed his hands. Now I want you to take that hat off. Sure. Whatever you say. He swept the hat from his head and twiddled it between his fingers in front of his crutch. That's very, very good. Now get out of my sight and tell the rest of the audience back there that if I so much as see them peep through a window, they'll be joining the Night Rider, except for the two sluts. Tell them we'll be needing them later. Understand? I, lo <laughs> I love the Night Rider, except in the movie, we're missing a very crucial line. Sure, whatever you say, mister. 
anything I say, he says, anything you say, anything I say, anything I say, what a wonderful philosophy you have. Bubba, Johnny. And then Bubba and Johnny split off. That's that's what happens in the movie. It's one of my favorite scenes in all of movies. Um, we don't get that here, but we get something that's just as great. Uh, yes, yes, I do, he said as he backed off down the platform, bumping into Kundalini and being pushed roughly against Diabono, Diabon, Diabondo. Uh, recovering his balance, he turned around and scurried off, head and shoulders hunched to hide in the depths of his office. Alone, the toe cutter walks towards the coffin. So right now, he would say, Bubba, Johnny, he stood looking down on it in silent reverie. Minutes passed while the rest of the horde shuffled their feet and licked their parched lips. Finally, the toe cutter turned and moved towards them. We go back and we wait for the pickup to arrive. You can't have a funeral without a hearse. His voice was cold and cruel. Those who knew him well understood that he was seething with a quiet, deadly rage. Oh my God, so much character and so good. Without another word, he led them back to their bikes and leaning against the saddle of his machine, stared down the road in the direction from which he expected the highly chromed pickup. He was a man apart, while the others gathered in small knots along the road, talking and horsing, and horsing it with each other, pulling on beer cans and throwing off their leathers. He was in another world. A demented world where fear and cruelty ruled, where hate was the god of destruction. Sorry, where hate was the god and destruction his servant. The toe cutter didn't even notice when mud when mud guts and clunk walked into the garage office. Mud guts found the owner in the darkness and at the rear of the building. Well, the slats, old man. <laughs> Almost with re relief, he replied, "In the diner. I, I told them to wait for you." Without another word, Mudguts turned on his heel and grabbing Clunk by the arm began to steer him out of the shop. The owner stifled an objection as Clunk grabbed a large gray inflatable plastic elephant from behind the counter and carried it out into the street. What do you want for that? What do you want that for? You crazy? I like that voice better. Uh, where are the sluts, old man? Uh, so yeah, that's so what that's 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 Mudguts. What do you want that for? You crazy? I never had an elephant before, Clunk replied with a wide grin and slow speech, which marked him as a simpleton. Ah, uh, got it. Mud, Mudguts left, left him to it and walked towards the diner. Clunk, carrying the toy under its front legs, walked into the middle of the street, placed it carefully on the road, and began to stroke its head. Mudguts walked into the diner, the waitress, a full-blown woman in her late 30s, with bleached hair and overripe breasts stood behind the counter talking to a man of similar age from his dress he was obviously the owner of the freight rig parked out front they looked at mud guts trying to keep all expression from their eyes he scanned the booths and tables at the back of the soiled decaying room he saw the girl sitting and talked to the two youths of about 17 or 18 arranging a sneer on his face he walked up to them I'm glad you decided to wait, he said, addressing the girls. They giggled at, They giggled and replied, <laughs> uh, Why don't you come outside and meet a few of the fellas? It was more a command than a request, but the look inquire, but they looked inquiring. Blah, 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 blah. It was more a command than a request, but they looked inquiringly at the youths. The taller of the two, a kid, Tom, was caught between fear of mud guts and the desire to continue chatting up the two girls. Oh, okay. So there's a guy. Wait, this is not. Wait, 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 wait. I missed. I misunderstood. Sorry. I have to take this back. At the back of the soil decaying room, he saw the girls sitting and talking to two youths of about 17 or 18. I was confused. So the girls were talking to two guys about 17 or 18, arranging a sneer on his face. He walked up to them. I'm glad you decided to wait. He addressed. Wait, is, is that mud guts or is that the two youths? Why don't you come outside and meet a few of the fellas? It was, it's mud guts. It was more of a command than a request, but they looked inquiringly at the youths. 
The taller of the two, a kid called Tom, was caught between fear of mud guts and a desire to continue chatting up the two girls, who he had already assessed as easy lays. Lust overcame his anxiety, and trying to look mud guts in the eye, he said, I think we're okay here. Thanks. Tom didn't even see it coming. Mudgut's right hand, still encased in leather riding gloves, swept the level of the tabletop and backhanded him across the mouth, splitting his lip and rattling his teeth. Still okay, boy, or would you like a little more unhappiness? Mudgut's spat out the words, and Tom's friend, Bobby, didn't make a move. The bikey was standing over them now, feeling the eyes of the waitress and the truckie on his back. Slowly, he leaned forward to Judy, the girl sitting nearest to him. When his face when his face was above hers, quick as lightning, he grabbed the top of her skimpy, halter-style T-shirt. He twisted it in his hands, tightening it across her shoulder blades, and dragged it downwards over her swelling breasts until they popped out. Wait a minute, what? The bikey was standing over them now, feeling the eyes of the waitress and the truckie on his back. Slowly, he leaned forward to Judy, the girl sitting nearest to him. That's one of the girls. When his face was above hers, quick as lightning, he grabbed the top of her skimpy halter-style t-shirt. He twisted it in his hands, tightening it across her shoulder blades, and dragged it downwards over her swelling breasts until they popped out. Mud guts glazed down at her nipples. The girl stared at him in fear. Now you'd like to come outside, wouldn't you? He said with a chuckle, <laughs> and then left the girl in no doubt about what he had in mind. I'm sure the guys would like to see more of you, he said with a leer. His throat was dry. She made no reply. Mudguts twisted the fabric of her top even tighter in his hand until it bit into the flesh just below her breasts. He jerked her to his feet and pulled her out from behind the table and, while the truckie and the waitress tried not to watch, began to pull her towards the door. Mudguts stopped. Mudguts mud stopped when he had her several steps away from the table, Tom licking and patting his split lip. Tom licking and patting his split lip and the other two, Bobby and Mary, sitting absolutely still. Turning half towards him, Mudguts put the fingertips of his left gauntlet to his lips and pulled it off with his teeth. Standing with it, he, he turned half towards them, Mudguts pulled the fingers of his left gauntlet, so he's pulling his gauntlet off. Um... Pulled it off with his teeth, standing with it still in his mouth, a smile crinkling in the corners of his eyes. He grabbed Judy's breast with his naked hand, kneading the flesh, feeling her nipples squashed against the palm of his hand. Slowly, he increased the pressure of his hand under his fingernail until his fingernails were biting into her, and he could feel her trying to squirm her way with pain. Ugh. The others watched with a mixture of fascination and fear. He let the glove drop from his teeth. I think your friends would probably like to join us, wouldn't they? Mary felt her heart skip a beat. The three of them knew that it was an order. Any attempt to refuse would only bring Mudguts and possibly some of his cronies down on them. They got to their feet. Mudguts looked Mary up and down. You, he said, indicating Mary. You're not going to allow your friend to go out there alone like this, are you? Mary shook her head. Good. That's why we need more cooperation around here. After all, it's all good, clean fun, isn't it? <laughs> White, that's kind of the same thing as the, the, the mechanic. That's the same, the, I'm doing the same voice, whatever. White face, she nodded her head. Isn't it, fellas? I mean, you're not upset or anything, are you? You tell mud guts if you're not having a good time. No, it's fine, said Bobby. Yeah, great, Tom said through his split, bleeding lip. Well, that's all straightened out then, he said with a mock relief. What's your name? He said to Mary. Mary. Well, Mary, as you said, you can't let your little friend go out half un uh, go out half undressed, all and all alone, can you? Well, Mary, as you said, you can't let your little friend go out half undressed and all alone, can you? Without waiting for an answer, he went on. So why don't you just join her? At the edge of the command, crept into his voice. Take your jeans off. Mary stared at him. You heard me, he rasped. His eyes bored into her, hand shaking. She began reluctantly to undo them. The waitress and the truckie didn't move. Slowly, she pulled their jeans over her hips, exposing the tiny V of the crotch of her pants to Mudgut's leering face, and one leg at a time, awkwardly pulled the denim over her shorts.
over her shoes. Now give them to one of the fellas there. We'll make him the wardrobe mistress, he said. Mary hands her jeans to Tom, who rolled them up and who rolled them up to carry in his hand. That looks better. Now turn around. To his satisfaction, Mudguts stared at the thighs and the shape of her arse. Well, I think we're ready now. There should be something here to please everyone, tits and bums. You two go first, he said to the two youths. Standing side by side, they walked out of the cafe and into the glare of the street. Their appearance was barely noticed, but seconds later, when Mudguts appeared at the door, flanked by the semi, semi-naked semi girls, a wild shout went up from a couple of the horde. Mudguts was smiling so much that his face was fitting to crack. Attracted, attracted by the first shout, the rest of the gang began to cheer and whoop their approval. Mudguts' appearance had, had disturbed... Mudguts' appearance had disturbed a strange performance by Clunk in the middle of the road. Although at first he had been content to just stroke the plastic elephant, he soon hit on the idea of using the plastic animal as a make-believe lover. Much to the amusement of the large group, gr- much to the amusement of the large group of his mates who gathered around, he began to kiss its ears and tell it a string of loving endearments. Gradually, he became more passionate in, in his embraces. He began to r- writhe, writhe on the ground with it, while several of the onlookers gave a running commentary on Clunk's attempts at seduction. Advice flowed freely. Clunk was having a great time and was disappointed when just at the moment it was obvious he was going to have his way with the elephant by now on its back, Mudguts came out of the cafe distracted the uh, and distracted the enthusiastic crowd. So everybody's gathered around Clunk, who's about to have sex with the plastic elephant, but Mudguts comes out with the half-naked youths, as they call them. These are underage girls, um, and everybody gets distracted. Nevertheless, he persevered despite the attraction which Mudguts and the two girls were offering to the beer-swilling bikies. Acknowledging the cheers of the gang, Mudguts instructed the two youths to walk towards the spot where Clunk was locked in the throes of passion. The girls moved closer to Mudguts as the clamor rose. He slipped his right arm around Judy's shoulders and brought his hand to rest on her breast, cradling it in his hand and holding the nipple between his thumb and forefinger. At the same time, he pulled his left arm around Judy's waist, pulling her close to him and slipping his fingers down the waistband of her pants until he could just touch her pubic hair. By any account, Mudgut's ingenuity and imagination had proved a winner. He was not only the center of attention, but it was obvious from their expressions that he had gained their admiration. Any of the others would have just dragged the two girls out of the cafe and thrown them into the street. Mudgut's decision to turn it into a titillating performance ensured that it would be a day to remember. For months, the horde would talk about the sight of Mudguts led out by two frightened youths appearing at the door of the cafe and walking across the main street of Jerusalem with a half-naked teenager on either side. The story would be embellished, exaggerated, and improved upon until, for a while at least, Mudguts would be a popular folk hero among the trash who rode the superhighways. Even Mudguts, who was not renowned for his sparkling intelligence, realized that he had brought off a major coup and he was enjoying it more and more by the minute. With the two girls locked firmly in position, he reached the outer edge of the crowd, which had gathered to watch Clunk's primitive lovemaking. He noticed with immense satisfaction how his comrades parted to allow the first, first the youths and then him and the girls through the front of the circle. As they walked through, the bikies, Judy, as they walked through the bikies, Judy felt rather than saw hands come out and grab her breasts. Rough hands were pressing and pulling at her flesh and fingers were squeezing her nipples. On the other side, Mary was having a similar problem. No sooner would she walk past one of the bikers than a hand generally accompanied by a a, a roach, raunchous laugh would dive between her thighs and make a grab at her crotch, at her crooch, at her crutch. 
Finally, they were at the front, and Clunk, relieved to find that he had not been completely overshadowed, began to throw himself into the lovemaking with renewed enthusiasm. The four teenagers stared in astonishment at the grown man writhing on the ground, clutching an inflatable toy to his groin and whispering filthy encouragements in its ear. Kundalini, standing next to them, turned to Judy. After an, an admiring glance at her breasts, he told her, Poor old clunk, poor old clunk. He used to be an authentic genius until he went over the high side. Is that that's not Kundalini's voice? I don't know. I don't know what a good voice is for Kundalini. I'm, just, I'm gonna go with that. He came out. He, he came out through the other mud guts. <laughs> mud guts continued. But when they put him back together, they had used a metal plate to replace most of his brain. <laughs> Yeah, that is the that's the that's the, the the grease monkey, but he doesn't have another scene. So we'll just we're gonna we're we're co-opting his voice now for mud guts. He's definitely not like the rest of us. No, maybe uh, Kundalini's more like Sean Connery a little bit. He's definitely not like the rest of us. Kundalini said with a laugh. Ha, ha, ha. I mean, who wouldn't want? Who wouldn't worry about screwing a plastic elephant when there are girls like you around and available? Moving close, that's not Kundalini, but whatever. Moving closer to Judy so that she could feel his leathers rasping against the flesh of her arm and smell his breath. He looked down at her and asked, you're available, aren't you? Mudguts was watching the performance by now fast approaching a climax as Clunk rutted around in the street with increasing frenzy. Judy knew that she hadn't heard Kundalini's veiled threat. Judy knew that she that he hadn't heard Kundalini's veiled threat. Yeah, sure, she faltered. And then as the idea stuck, as the idea struck her simple mind, she continued with more confidence. But I don't want all these guys. I'm not available to all of them, you know. Oh, oh, I think you'd be surprised, little chicken. I think you'd be really surprised. That is terrible. Kundalini turned to Mudguts and in a soft, mocking, mock solicitous voice, told him that Judy had made it clear that she was available, but not to everyone, but not to everyone, mind. Mudguts roared with laughter, and before Judy knew what was happening, he had plunged his hands down her jeans and into her pants. You're right, Kund you're right, Kundalini. I think you're right, he said. Mary, standing on the other side of Mudguts, was trying her hardest to stop another of the gang, stroking her between the legs from behind. She couldn't see who was doing it, but from the laughter in her ear, it was obvious he was enjoying it. Finally, in the middle of the circle in front of them, Clunk gave a low moan, separate, a low, ah, suck suck at reading finally in the middle of the circle in front of them clunk gave a long low moan separating himself from the battered toy and struck the attitude of a man exhausted this brought cheers and a shower of beer cans from the audience which now turned its attention on mud guts and his newfound young friends shall we go back to the diner shall we go back to the diner kitties mud guts asked making no attempt to remove his hands from judy's crutch Crutch, as they call it, crutch. That's weird. I, <laughs> I think it's about time we tested the availability of the model. And Kundalini, Kundalini gave a whoop and turned to Mary, much to the delight of the onlookers. Grabbed one of her breasts in his powerful hand and pulled her top partially down, exposing the other one to the hungry eyes of the gang. Kundalini, you better bring the two boyfriends along. We wouldn't want them to miss out, would we? Kundalini turned towards Tom and with no warning smacked him with an open palm across his mouth, opening his lip again and causing a small trickle of blood to edge its way down the cleft of his chin. Come on, you two, was all he said as he pushed Bobby and Tom in front of him. Mudguts and Judy were leading the procession across the street. Judy's breasts by now were sore and red from the constant mangling they had been receiving and her jeans were unzipped to the crutch. The two youths followed behind them, Kundalini and the almost naked Mary, and then a group of about 30 or 40 of the gang. All of them were prepared to make sure they didn't miss out on when uh, all of them were prepared to make sure they didn't miss out when Kundalini and Mudguts, two of the toe cutter's most trusted lieutenants, 
and finish with the girls. At the door of the diner, Mudguts turned to the rest of them and said, You guys wait here. Just be patient. Kundalini and I are going to go in and see if we can come to some sort of friendly arrangement with the two young ladies and the boyfriends. Um, his little address brought cheers, jeers, and laughter from the crowd. But it was the storm of beer cans that followed which drove the six of them inside. The waitress and the trucky had disappeared, and Mudguts decided to go and search the toilets for them. He didn't want some fool coming in and disturbing his fun. As Mudguts disappeared through the door, Bobby saw his chance. Kundalini was standing at the window, drawing a hail of abuse from the rest of the gang and returning, returning it with obscene gestures. Bobby grabbed Mary by the hand and dragged her towards the back of the diner, past the rows of the tables and out through the back door. Judy on the other side of Kundalini and Tom standing several feet away and paying more attention to his lip than anything else had been too slow to notice what had happened until they heard the back door slam and the bolt slide across from the outside. Wait, as Mudguts disappeared through the door, Bobby saw his chance. Kundalini was standing at the window, drawing a hail of abuse from the rest of the gang and returning it with obscene gestures. Bobby grabbed Mary by the hand and dragged, sorry, I was spacing out. He grabs Mary by the hand and dragged her towards the back of the diner, past the rows of the tables and out through the back door. So this scene, we see a super abbreviated version of this scene after the, the train station scene, but there's only two youths and it's a boyfriend and a girlfriend in the hot rod car and they just drive off. But this is a way more complicated version. And why wasn't this shot in this way? It could be because it's a super graphic scene and maybe Miller was like, looked good on paper, but realizing it would be a lot harder to film. Or it's very possible that they just could not, they just resources and time and, you know, scheduling, and they just, they had to truncate the scene. And that happens. That happens a lot. They truncate the scene and they think in their minds, well, you know, this is communicating what's happening here. And it's not. Uh, Judy on the other side of Kundalini and Tom standing several feet away and paying more attention to his lip than anything else had been too slow to notice that, Tom, that Bobby and Mary had escaped, right? Until he heard the back door slam and the bolt slide across from the outside. Kundalini swiveled on his heel, smashing his fist into Tom's chest to knock, knock him out of the way and ran for the door. It was too late. Bobby and Mary were already out of the storeroom and on the other side of the door and running for their lives across 20 yards of open paddock to Bobby's hot rod parked under the cover of a small lean-to shed. So yeah, so that's Bobby and Mary are, and we see them again in a later scene, Bobby and Bobby gets, you know, Bobby gets plowed in, uh, for lack of a, of a, of a different descriptor that I can't use on YouTube. He gets, you know, he gets taken as well as Mary. And that's when Goose calls him a turkey, remember? Bobby threw himself into the driver's seat and desperately fired the engine while Mary clambered into the passenger seat. With a squeal of rubber and a billowing cloud of dust, the lovingly customized hot rod, that's the thats the, the red hot rod, the like orangish hot rod with the fire on the side and the, the six uh, exhaust pipes coming out of the, the, the hood of the car. With a squeal of rubber and a billowing cloud of dust, the lovingly customized hot rod blasted out of the shed in reverse. As soon as he was clear, Bobby stood on the brakes, moved his T-bar shift into drive and fishtailing and fishtailing blah, and fishtailing across the paddock, accelerated as fast as his heart was pounding towards the open highway. Kundalini was already out the front door of the cafe, closely followed by Mudguts, swearing and cursing the moment he took his eyes off the kids. Um, come on, catch that bastard in high. Catch that bat wait. Come on, catch that bastard in the hoon machine, he called to the bikers as he passed the, as he passed at a sprint. Um, Kundalini was almost at his bike when he was stopped dead by a roar from the toe cutter. Kundalini, wait. The toe cutter had forgotten the hearse. He was concerned with avenging the honor of his tribe. Some smart arse kid had tried to outsmart them, had tried to defy their will, and would now have to pay the price. He asserted his authority as leader. Bubba, Mudguts, Johnny, you'll ride with me. Make sure you've got chains. It's damnation alley we're headed for. Anybody else is welcome to join us. The 
toe cutter mounted his machine. You know who would have been it made a great toe cutter? Also, uh, Oliver Reed. That because I'm that's the voice I'm kind of doing. It's a little little Oliver Reed. Oliver Reed would have been a great toe cutter. The toe cutter mounted his machine and walked it backwards into the middle of the street. He waited and faced the direction in which Bobby had disappeared until his four lieutenants were ready. Then winding out the accelerator almost to full throttle and dropping the clutch, he allowed the huge bike to rear up its back wheel before throwing his weight forward and roaring out of Jerusalem at better part than 80 miles an hour. Close on his back wheel and arranged in a flying wedge were Kundalini, Mudguts, Bubba, and Johnny. Farther back, them, another 20 or 30 bikes, started down the highway. Nobody left in Jerusalem, not the waitress, the truckie, Judy, Tom, nor any of the bikies who remained had any doubt that the toe cutter and his companions would waste the two teenagers. It was now just a matter of passing time until the leader returned. Six or seven of the bikies, more brutal looking than even Mudguts and Kundalini, swaggered up to the front door of the diner and pushed it open. Judy and Tom began to back off towards the rear of the room, but they were onto them before they could even get halfway. Almost casually, they picked Tom up and holding him shoulder high, carried him towards the front of the cafe and pitched him head first through the window onto the counter of three on the count of three. So that happens in the, in the, in the movie, but it happens at the beginning as the four animals moved towards Judy. She was saved by the bell as out on the road, the toe cutter caught sign of Bobby's hot rod. The toe cutter signaled to the four behind him. The toe cutter signaled to the four behind him. They gave their bikes all they could, crouching down behind the fairing and working throttles to wring every last ounce of power out of them. They were fast overhauling the gleaming hot rod. Pretty as it was, it couldn't match either the acceleration or the top speed of the bikes, which were hunting it into the ground. With less than half a mile between them, the toe cutter slowly began to unwrap a length of heavy chain from his wrist and upper arm. As he waited, as he waited it in his hand to make sure he was familiar with its feel and length, Kundalini carefully unclasped the length of an iron bar, which he carried along the, the length of his full fuel tank. Uh, so he carries an iron bar along the length of his fuel tank. The others, Johnny, Bubba, and Mudguts, were all armed with chains too, as they finally reached their prey. See, in the movie, it's a giant meat cleaver. Seen from above, the bikers swarming around the hot rod would have looked like flies around a carcass. On the ground, it was much more terrifying. The toe cutter appeared alongside the driver's side window, the hint of a grin on his face, and swung his chain with such force that it smashed the glass. Instinctively, Bobby threw the wheel to the other way, almost running Kundalini off the road. Kundalini recovered quick. Kundalini recovered quickly and, coming back alongside the hot rod, used his length of pipe to shatter the rear window. Mary screamed. The blood was pouring across her forehead, tears coursing down her cheeks. She felt her bladder about to give way. The toe cutter was back besides Bobby's door. With a deft flick of his wrist, he sent the chain flashing through the window. With a piercing scream, Bobby felt his cheekbone shatter, sending a blind bolt of pain up the right side of his face. That is terrifying. And into his eye. The hot rod was out of control, sending the bikes peeling off in all directions. Desperately, Bobby fought to control the rampaging monster, trying to ignore the paralysis, which was spreading across his face and prevent the vehicle from hurtling off the edge of the road. Just in time, he corrected his steering, but already the vultures, joined now by more of their breed, were around him again. Sheer, stark, terror was written all across mary's face she was mouthing meaningless words clutching at anything that struggled to the surface of her collapsing mind she looked up to see a grinning face at her window and then as if in slow motion a long length of pipe prescribed an arc through the air and bounced off the windscreen once again once again it came with the same result and again, and once more, as she watched in horror. But this time, the whole of the windscreen just frosted over. Bobby couldn't see a thing. Panic had deprived him of all reason, and it never occurred to him to shove his fist through the shattered glass. 
Already, another member of the gang was at his window, wielding a crowbar and trying to get into position to jam it into his face. Bobby flinched. Bobby flinched, pulled the wheel away, and hurtled off the shoulder of the road across about 30 yards of scrub and broke his front axle into a ditch. By the time he and Mary realized what had happened, the, bike, the bikies were already swarming all over the car. A leather riding boot came through the shattered windscreen, spraying fragments of glass all over them. A crowbar smashed through the roof just behind their heads. Hands were tearing at the doors. A fist came through the window and wreaked havoc with Bobby's already fractured face. The passenger side door was ripped off its hinges. Mary felt calloused hands grappling her. She was pulled from the car, not knowing whether she was struggling or not. She felt gravel tearing at her flesh as she was dragged into the scrub. That is absolutely terrifying and absolutely more harrowing than the very quick montage that we get in the movie. Chapter 8. Max found Bobby wandering naked along the side of the highway five or six hours later. So Max comes to the scene of the crime. The kid was mumbling nonsense. So up to this point, we really haven't seen anything of Jim Goose, um, which is interesting. The kid was mumbling nonsense. This is Bobby. His eyes refusing to focus and one side of his face, a bloody collapsed mess. Looking closer, Max saw a trickle of blood coursing down his cheek from one ear with guttering horror, noticing that a hunk of flesh had been carved out of one side of his arse. Oh my God. So that's what the blood was. So he wasn't taken. I guess that was their quick way of, they just splattered some blood on his butt, but that in, in the script, in the, in the novelization, he had a whole hunk of flesh carved out of his ass. After several minutes, Max realized that it was pointless to try and get any sense out of him. So he steered him back to the pursuit special and wrapped him in a crude and wrapped a crude bandage around his loins and got him to lie down in the back seat where he blubbered to himself, where he blubbered himself to sleep. About one and a half miles up the road, Max found what he was looking for. Over in the scrub was the remains of the hot rod. It looked at first sight as though it had been torn apart. None of the panels remained intact. The bonnet, the doors, and the boot had all been wrenched off. So the trunk, the hood, and the doors had all been wrenched off. The tires were slashed and the windows battered in. Max picked up his shotgun and approached wearily, wearily. He could barely believe what he had found. A superbike was lying in the scrub nearby. The scrub is like the bushes, I guess. And its rider, Johnny the Boy, was propped up against the side of the wreck. Tied to his left foot was one end of a long length of chain. Several yards away, the other end was attached to a collar around the neck of the naked, unconscious young girl, Mary. Her hair was a tangled mess. Bruises already dotted her body, and there were specks of blood in her groin. Max approached the bikey, who was mumbling and talking to himself. And in the move, in the movie, he goes, "The Night Rider," and then and then Jim Goose goes, "He's whacked right out of his skull." And then Johnny the Boy goes, "Whack right out of his skull, man!" <laughs> oh, he's like, "Whack right out of his skull, man!" I used to have the, those sound bites on Winamp, dude, just to hear those those pieces from the movie. He's whacked right out of his skull. The Night Rider. That, that that he's just he's 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 stoned and whatever. Uh, let's see let's see how they do it in the book in the novelization. Max approached the bike. He was mumbling and talking to himself. Quietly, he positioned himself along. Quietly, he positioned himself alongside him, and then put the barrel of the shotgun at his ear. Okay, fella, don't move. Should I do more of a? It's more gravelly in the movie in the in the U.S. Stuff. Okay, fella, don't move. Something like that. Eh, whatever. Johnny did nothing to indicate that he was even aware of Max's existence. Can you hear me, kid? Or do you want me to blow your head off? Johnny did nothing except continue to move his lips and dribble down to his chin. Satisfied that the bike was no threat, satisfied that the bikey was no threat, Max moved on to the girl. Gently, he shook her until her eyes opened. Immediately, he saw naked panic in them. No, 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 no more. I'll do it. I promise I'll, I'll do anything. Oh, oh, it's her. No, 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 no more. 
I'll do it. I promise I'll do anything, she babbled. Suddenly, she was on all fours, growling and barking like a dog. Holy shit, that is friggin' intense, dude. That is so fucked. You know what's amazing? You know what's so effective about that as a storytelling device? Like, you don't have to show us the graphic scene of her in that action. You show us the aftermath, and it allows our imagination to piece it together. Just in that one paragraph, no, 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 no more. I'll do it. I'll promise I'll do anything she babbled. Suddenly, she was on all fours, growling and barking like a dog. Tells you everything that you need to know. It's so, man, that is that is really good writing. Hey, it's okay. I'm not here. I'm not going to hurt you, he said softly. That's Max. She continued to act like some sort of watchdog. Max realized that the only way to get through to her broken mind was to take command. Stop that, he ordered. Now sit there and be quiet. She obeyed immediately. So in a matter of six hours, her mind was broken and she's acting like a dog. Max returned to Johnny and lifted his eyelids up to test for a response. Whacked out of his tiny mind. There's the line. It's different, though. Whacked out of his tiny mind, Max muttered to himself, noting the sweat pouring off the kid's body, the glazed pupils, and the meaningless mutterings. Whacked right out of his skull, man. Uh, Max untied the dog chain and took <clears throat> and took off his jacket and wrapped it around the girl's shoulders. Easily, he picked her up in his arms and carefully placed her in the passenger seat of his car. Next, he went for Johnny, unceremoniously dragging him by the shoulders across the scrub and propping him against the front wheel while he rearranged Bobby on the back seat. With a heave, he picked up Johnny. Uh, with a heave, he picked Johnny up and got him in a fireman's hold over his shoulder, staggering until the uh, staggering under the weight of the babbling bikey. He kicked his seat forward and began to fold him into the back. Just as Johnny's face was alongside his ear, he caught what he was saying. Remember the night rider when you look up into the sky. The night rider ain't never coming back. He's a rock and roller, an out of controller. Max let him slump back in the seat. Well, it looks like Jesse might be right after all. The Knight Rider, the toe cutter. Anyway, we'll see. This is when Max talks to himself. That's like the worst parts of this book. Like, it's not good. It's not. Miller is like, we don't need that. Miller just lets his actors like, you know, sit in the scene. And it's different. Max climbed into the front seat, activated the sirens and headed off on the long haul to the nearest hospital. Okay, that brings us to chapter nine. We're gonna we're gonna put a pin in it there. Uh, so we got two vastly different, uh, not vastly different. We got one uh, somewhat different scene, and yeah, that's not true. The first scene was vastly different, and the second one is, you know, it's we we know we're, we're aware of it. We're we've seen it. We we're familiar with it. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. In any case, um, looking forward to, to to reading more. We're almost we're almost halfway. We're almost at the halfway point of the book, um, and things are just structured differently than in the movie. As you know, Riot Stickers is the sponsor of the Frumis channel. You can get a thousand stickers for seventy nine dollars at riotstickers.com backslash Frumis. You're not going to find this deal anywhere else on the internet. Click in the link in the description below. Uh, Riot stickers, they have a UV coating that protects from the sun. They're printed on vinyl to protect from water. They're, they, they're, they're very weatherproof. They come three inches by three inches. You can't go wrong. So we'll see you next time with another reading of Mad Max of the Novelization. I'm your host, Jeff. I never say that. I don't know why I just said it just now. Thank you for joining us. Peace, hair grease, and Riot stickers, baby. Hi, I'm a guy from RiotStickers.com, the merch company known for being the bomb. Do you hate going to work? But like getting paid? Do you hate snow? But want to make sweet, sweet love to a snowman? Hmm, that was unexpected. All right, what about this? Do you hate paying for stuff, but like having custom t-shirts? You are in luck. We can't help but... I am so sorry. That was the wrong Riot Stickers uh, commercial. This is... This is the proper Riot Stickers commercial.